Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is Drupal Diversity and Inclusion. It is our sort of initiative update. Um, we are Drupal Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, I am the leader of the group. My name is Tara King. You might know me on the internet as Sparkling Robots, and I work for Pantheon. And I'll let you all introduce yourselves. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess we're going to reverse order. So, hi, I'm Ellie. Uh, I currently work for Open Strategy Partners as a content and communications marketing person, or just whatever needs doing. Um, in the Drupal community, I'm with the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Leadership Team, as I said, and also the mentoring team. So, that's what I do. I'll probably do some other stuff, too. Alana. Hi, I'm Alana. Um, you can find me online at aburk66. Um, on Slack, I'm just my name, Alana Burke. I'm also a Slack admin if you need any help. Um, I'm a developer and also a Drupal trainer. I'm currently freelancing and contracting, but I would very much love to have a full-time job, so if you're hiring, please talk to me. Just She's a little great. <laughs> <laughs> just a little plug. All right. That's actually to Okay. So when we do this presentation, we usually do a land acknowledgement, and in North America, this is usually some kind of indigenous, non-white people, and when I went to do research for the Netherlands, this is a little bit of a different kind of a land acknowledgement than we're used to. Um, but we wanted to do something all the same, so in my research, I came across the Frisians, who are a minority people dating back to 700 BCE, and uh, so uh, Frisian is their language. It's a West Germanic language uh, spoken in its West Frisian form by an estimated 400,000 people who live in the province of Friesland, where the total population is about 640,000. It's also spoken by another 300,000 people who left Friesland to find work elsewhere in the Netherlands. Uh, and most Frisians are bilingual in both Frisian and Dutch. Um, I also read that Frisian is a language that is uh, one of the most similar to English um, of all the, the other languages out there. Uh, some of the earliest settlements in Friesland date to about 700 BCE, and the Frisians became a distinctive tribe in about 200 BCE. Um, they resisted the Romans, in 250 CE, uh, BCE, Friesland was, uh, no, in CE, sorry, uh, Friesland was flooded and the Frieslands moved to Flanders and England before actually returning in 400. And then in 1648, Friesland joined the United Republic of the Netherlands, um, which kind of hastened the decline of their, their language, which was already under pressure from German and Dutch, and, uh, but it marked the beginning of, of modern Frisian movement and culture. Um, and so today, under the legal system, um, so Frisian can be used in courts of law, it's a legal official language, um, but the official language of, of legal documents is, is Dutch. So in 2001, the Netherlands and the Frisian government signed a covenant um, to sort of help you know, the continuation and the fostering of the, the Frisian language, but it sort of isn't quite up to par to how some people would like it, and they feel that, you know, their, their culture and their language are still kind of declining, and they feel like the Dutch government really isn't doing enough. So I thought this was really interesting, and it's still, it's still kind of the same story that we see in other indigenous cultures, even though we might look at these people and say, like, well, they don't look any different. Um, but it was really interesting, and then I found a lot of stuff about their sort of historic costumes and traditional garb that they wear. Um, so that's just a little bit about a, a land acknowledgement right here in Amsterdam. So today we're going to discuss a handful of topics. Um, the first one, why do we care about anything other than code? Drupal's, Drupal's software, why do we care about the rest of it? We're gonna talk about some common misconceptions about diversity in tech. Nine things you can make do to make a difference. And uh, who are we? Who is DDI? Who is Drupal Diversity and Inclusion? So why 
do we care about anything other than code? Um, because software is people. <laughs> Just like Soylent Green, software is actually made of people. It has our vision, our values, our language, and even our biases built into it. So who makes the software matters. <laughs> and there's no such thing as neutral. You know, we want to believe in facts and objectivity, and we want to believe that, you know, this code that gets boiled down to zeros and ones is just neutral, but it can't be. We cannot help but to center things on our own perspective. Um, Ken Rickard had a fantastic talk. Um, I think last year that said that monocultures often can't see their own biases. It's like being nose blind to your own smell. You can't help but but to you know everything around you is you know it's it's about you. So stop trying to work towards some kind of baseline that really isn't going to be as objective as you think. So we encode our values into the things that we create. You know, software is made by humans. All humans have values. All humans have biases. So our software has our biases, whether conscious or not, built into it. You know, values are things that you think are good or bad. You know, maybe you love certain kinds of music. You know, you love your family, even though they might be problematic. You appreciate your family's culture, history, you know, maybe you hate clowns, maybe you love well-documented code, maybe you hate flash, maybe you value fairness, whatever it is. Nobody is truly neutral. No one lives a truly neutral existence. You know, especially when we're surrounded by other humans. So these values are also biases. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's negative. You know, I like kittens and guinea pigs. That's a bias. No one's gonna say that that's a bad thing, but it's a bias. I am biased towards kittens and guinea pigs. But many times we grow up exposed to ideas about other people that we just take for granted. You know, even if we objectively learn that they are not true, those patterns remain imprinted on our brains. So our software has our biases, whether conscious or not, built into it. And algorithms aren't neutral. It's just like our code, they're built by us, by humans. Oh, here's a quote. After an audit of the algorithm, the resume screening company found that the algorithm found two factors to be the most indicative of job performance. If their name was Jared, and whether they played high school lacrosse. So, um, this was an article called Companies Are on the Hook If Their Hiring Algorithms Are Biased. Amazon thought it would be smart to use neutral forms to assess job applicants instead of humans, because humans are biased and machines aren't, right? But if we put garbage in, we get garbage out. So they fed it their existing employees, and so the algorithm just reinforced the stereotypes of all the humans who already worked there. So all the humans who had already done the hiring and all of the stereotypes that they already had were just reinforced by the algorithm. That's all that happened. And the word women, like in women's sports, would cause the algorithm to specifically rank applicants lower. Ouch. Yeah. That's <laughs> pretty yeah. <so> failed. <laughs> It was, the whole thing was just a disaster. So we all have our personal biases, but when our history and institutions are built on top of bias, this is when we get structural inequality. So we encode our biases into the institutions and cultures that we create. So this leads to generations of injustice. And then discrimination moves from a personal issue into a systemic problem. And this ensures that equality conti inequality continues even without anyone actually being racist or sexist. 
So we have a generation right now where everyone is saying, you know, why does this matter? We're not racist and we're not sexist. Well, maybe our parents and our grandparents and their grandparents were, and the institutions that they built reflected their values and their biases, and that's the world that we're living in. So those are the things that we have to change, and that's the reason that we have to change, because of the structural inequality that was built from a world that, you know, a hundred years ago or whatever, we don't live in that world anymore. So sociologists who study inequality distinguish between individual bias, which is negative beliefs about a group held by individual persons, and systemic inequality, um, which is unequal outcomes built into our institutions that will produce inequality even in the absence of biased individuals. And this is um, sort of a We've got a, an image here of a, you know, a pyramid and showing, um, you know, we've got a, you know, a society here which has the pharaoh and our government officials and our soldiers and our scribes and our merchants and our artisans and our um, farmers and our slaves and you know, there's there's bias that's been built into society since you know the beginning of time like there there have always been people who were thought of as as lesser as not you know the people who had to haul blocks of limestone up the pyramids to build them and you know unless you somehow reverse those inequalities and that you know systemic injustice that was done you're not going to be able to do anything to fix it and it's just going to keep happening So these systems privilege some people, whether they want it or not. Privilege isn't something you can choose to opt in or out of. You know, I didn't choose to have white privilege. You know, men didn't choose to have male privilege, but we got it anyway. So the question that matters isn't whether we have it, but what are we going to do with it? So it's important to understand it. Um, really, really great quote here is, in the role playing game known as the real world, straight white male is the lowest difficulty setting there is. You can lose playing on the lowest difficulty setting, but the lowest difficulty setting is still the easiest setting to win on. So, you know, privilege, it's not about guilt or blame. It's about recognizing that there are systems that advantage or disadvantage entire groups of people through no fault or credit of their own. It doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong, and it doesn't mean that you have done anything right. So, you know, I'm a woman, but I grew up really, really poor. I grew up with a single mom, but I also grew up with a really, really educated mom who did everything she could to get me into every class and give me every kind of education advantage you could ever imagine. And nobody knew how poor we were. Because education, you know, you look at well-dressed, educated kid and you never think about that. So, you know, I had advantages there. So, you know, these things, they, you know, your privileges, they, some of them might cancel each other out. You know, it's not, you know, just having one privilege doesn't mean that you're automatically, you know, some sort of you, magically sailing through life and not having one doesn't mean that you're magically doomed. It just means that there are different considerations to take into that affect how you are going to go through life. So, you know, talking about this, you know, imaginary role-playing game idea of, you know, this life that we live, you know, the, the default behaviors for all of the straight white male are, you know, 
the NPCs that you would run into, the non-player characters, they're easier on you. You know, everything that you run into is going to be a little bit easier for you. The default barriers for completions of quests are lower. You know, you're going to level up faster. You're going to get more experience faster. Um, so it's just about sort of thinking about why that happens and how it happens and stop thinking about, you know, assigning blame or guilt or wondering why and just sort of accepting that it happens and wondering, you know, and, and then thinking, you know, what are you going to do about it and how are you going to, you know, move forward and thinking about other people's privilege compared to your own and, and how might you use your own privilege to help other people. Oops. And so the result of privilege is an uneven playing field that perpetuates itself and causes a lot of harm. You know, privilege tends to beget privileged. Privileged people have privileged kids who have more privileged kids who have more privileged kids. Underprivileged people tend to have underprivileged kids who have more underprivileged kids who have more underprivileged kids. Um, you know, you can, sometimes you can think of it in terms of class, like it is very hard to move up in terms of class. Um, it's not a direct analogy, but you can kind of think of that a little bit. Um, you know, privileged kids get the good internships and they get the good jobs from the good internships and that stuff tends to perpetuate. Um, and the people who don't have that privilege tend to not have anything that helps them get more privilege. So I think next is me. Yep. All right, so with that basis of sort of where we're coming at, the perspective we're taking, I'm going to cover some well-intended attitudes that don't actually help in these discussions. Some of these are things that I have believed in the past, or they're certainly, I think all of them are things I've heard in the Drupal community. Um, for people who think that they're doing good work here and think that this is helping and I think is actually kind of, um, can sometimes perpetuate the systems we're talking about. So, you know, thoughts and prayers aren't always actually what we need in this world. Uh, sometimes we need action. So uh, free speech and tolerance of all give everyone equal opportunity. So uh, we love free things in Drupal, free software, and all the things, right? Um, but there's this thing called the paradox of tolerance. The paradox of tolerance, okay, there's too many nopes. <laughs> <laughs> I never think there's too many nopes. Uh, so the paradox of tolerance uh, was it, sort of coined by Karl Popper, who was writing in Germany in the late, uh, like 1945. And basically pointed out that if you tolerate the intolerant, tolerance itself will not survive. Um, so, you know, I think sometimes code of conduct type things, policies can say like, oh, everyone's welcome, which seems quite inclusive and welcoming. But if you welcome someone who hates women, I'm not going to feel included as one example, right? So I think this is something that, um, especially in these open communities, we really need to be talking about a lot. Here's our super handy graph. Intolerance cannot be included inside of tolerance. It is paradoxical. It is strange, but it is true. Um, open sources and meritocracies, everyone gets a chance to contribute. Right? Like, um, no, sorry. Um, it's certainly, there are many merits to people who contribute to open source and things like that. But because there are so many structural barriers against some people trying to contribute to open source, um, it just, it, there can be the best person in the world who doesn't have internet access or the best person in the world who doesn't speak the language of the project. It's um, rife with structural barriers that actually prevent meritocracy from being really all that valuable. Um, Dries talked about this in a Seattle keynote. There's also a post-meritocracy manifesto that some open source contributors have put together um, that talks about this. Super recommend it. It's good stuff. There are no minorities available to work in tech. I'm trying to hire them and they don't apply to my jobs. Like, they just don't exist. This is false. We're, we're, all, we're all here. We're a real person. Uh, this is just one example. I got, Intel set a goal to hire 40% from underrepresented, my, underrepresented people in tech. And they got 43%. And their CEO said basically, if the pipeline was the problem, I would have failed. But the pipeline isn't the problem. There certainly could be better. Um, but in general, there are plenty of people, talented people, for underrepresented groups already in tech, already with the skills we need. Um, a lot of them work in proprietary software um, for a lot of reasons, but they have much better diversity than we do. 
Um, so we need to start sort of uh, investing in our community now, making it a safe place for people to be today so that as those people are coming in from the pipeline, they have somewhere safe to be and they don't drop out of tech altogether. Let's just help women in tech first, then we'll get to everybody else. Um, we like to talk about issues being intersectional, right? So a lot of uh, diversity and tech initiatives say, oh, we're gonna focus on gender and once we fix gender, then we'll fix race, then we'll fix whatever. Um, but it doesn't take into account the fact that all of these issues really um, sort of intersect and amplify, right? So there's the experience of being a woman and the experience of being, say, an immigrant, and then the experience of being an immigrant woman is a totally different and unique place. Those two kinds of oppressions actually um, interact and often make it worse. Um, so we like to look at things as intersectionally as possible to bring along all people together rather than you know one group at a time. But we have nice policies and good intent. Uh, again, intent does not equal impact. This is something we talk about a lot. So often, uh, like with microaggressions, people aren't actually trying to be mean to you or anything. They, they just don't realize their own internal biases. But if I were to drop an anvil on, on Ellie, Ew. yeah, it hurts. <laughs> if I dropped it on purpose, I should get fired. But if I dropped it accidentally, it still broke her foot, right? Like, it, you have to actually look at the intent as well as the impact. Um, and I think often impact over intent myself. We have one really smart black person. Let's put her in charge of diversity. Um, certainly, if this person is volunteering, sure. But a lot of times what happens is there's like the one underrepresented person at the company and they're like, Ellie, will you please take on the charge of improving all of our company culture and fix, fix, fixing our hiring and all of the things? Uh, this frequently leads to burnout of that employee who's really just trying to like write some software. Uh, and it also leads to that person becoming a lightning rod for controversial issues within the company and often getting fired. Um, I've heard of that story many times. Um, you should help us hire. Now we're firing you. It's a mess, right? So um, what you want to do is not uh, put extra work on people just because they fit a certain demographic, but rather support them in their goals at work, do that kind of thing, uh, you know, like make them happy there. And then, like I said, if they volunteer, it's no problem, but um, it's important to not just make it that person's problem. Uh, we also wanted to use this to talk a little about the difference between diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, you have that one person on your team, your team's a little bit more diverse. If that person is not actually included, that's a problem. So we wanna make sure that they feel welcome and that they feel like they're part of the team and not just like a token hire. And then equity is where they actually are a fully participatory, fully empowered member of the team. That's obviously the goal, right? We want everyone to be fully empowered and not just like, oh, we hired you so it'll look better, but we're not actually gonna to listen to you. So, I think this slide is not looking the way it's supposed to look. There we go, we'll hide it with butterflies. <laughs> now to Ellie, about butterflies. Woo, okay. Uh, hi, so I went looking for a quote to put on this slide and I found Susan Sontag. This is actually a book of essays I really enjoyed. Uh, she said, the likelihood that your acts of resistance cannot stop the injustice does not exempt you from acting in what you sincerely and reflectively hold to be the best interests of your community. Did we all get that? <laughs> cool, yay, then I don't have to do the slide. Um, so, but honestly, to me, this does speak to sort of the moral obligations of participating in a space. Sorry about the butterflies. No, it's not your fault. <laughs> problematic today. Um, so if you are in a space and you want to continue participating in a space, I, I do feel that you have an obligation to take care of that space and the other people in it. Um, it may or may not work out perfectly, but you should still try. So on that note, some small things you can do to uh, help out. Number one, say hi to new people. So if there are new folks in your community, you haven't seen them before, just say, hello, how are you? Welcome. Um, this is really hard for me because I'm super shy. You may not have noticed that because I was on stage and now I'm here, but I'm super shy. Um, so some things I do personally are just saying, gosh, this coffee line is really slow or I wish they had the coffee out longer. Just 
to somebody you're standing next to. Just casual conversation. Doesn't have to be anything fancy, but it does help someone feel like they are also welcome and involved. It's a very tiny way, just conversationally. Less lonely in the crowd. Um, there's also noticing who's in the room and who isn't. So, for example, uh, I went to a panel earlier today and I noticed it was fantastic. The panel, I think, was actually a 50-50 representation gender-wise. Uh, but I looked around the room and I thought, hmm, this room is not really representative of the same demographic balance I saw like, in the keynote audience this morning. And that just stood out to me. I'm not entirely certain what to do about it. Maybe there was another talk at that time where there were more folks. I don't know. But I noticed, and I'm talking about it. Um, familiarize yourself with the code of conduct for events you attend. This is pretty important. Um, I think Drupal has done a lot of work on our code of conduct to improve it. Um, but at the very least, just reading it yourself will help you know what's expected of you and help you make any recommendations or changes that you think might help out in the future. And it is pretty important to read. I know especially a lot of underrepresented people in the community are probably reading it just so they know what's what's available to them if somebody's harassing them. It's also like 10 feet tall in the three. lobby. It's bigger <laughs> than I am. So that's code of conduct. Um, hold a space for and amplify the voices of others. So the, um, oh yeah. the, okay, the image here is a scarf someone knit during uh, an event and they were just knitting in a different color for who was speaking. So the red were all uh, male folks. <laughs> it's yeah. not accessible. <laughs> it's also it's not, not accessible, it's a good call. The really large amounts of yarn color there are male folks and the less represented <laughs> color are female folks, non-binary. You get the idea. Uh, so uh, when you're in a space like this, something you can do is just speak up yourself if you were able to and say, hey, you know, Tara, I noticed that you haven't been speaking. Do you have anything to add to this conversation? That sort of thing. Be prepared to interrupt harassment and other problematic behavior. That's uh, similar, just speaking up for someone else if you feel safe doing so and saying, hey, I see that um, you wrote down examples. <clears throat> oh, right. Um, you've just used the wrong pronouns for my coworker. They are a they, not a she. Um, or reminding folks about accessible colors. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're knitting. Um, <laughs> talk to friends and colleagues about issues that matter to you. This is um, difficult. I think it's difficult, um, but something I do once in a while is just pop a link into a water cooler channel and say, hey, you know, X, Y, and Z stood out to me in this article. That's it. Just leave it. See what happens. See if anybody else wants to talk about it. The, or be a little more bold if you're not. <laughs> be as bold as you want to be. Be as mild as you want to be. Um, sponsor people with less privilege than you. This. Um, this is about sponsoring rather than mentoring, and they're kind of different concepts. So mentoring, I think, is sort of one-on-one. -on -one. You're teaching someone, showing them the ropes, helping them understand the system. Sponsoring is more sharing a spare ticket to, a, a, I don't know, CTO event, or maybe you have extra airline miles that you can help somebody else get a ticket to a conference, or just sharing some of your privilege in whatever way works. And fixing your recruitment and hiring. Uh, I think we already talked about the pipeline a little bit, and some of the things you can do are really end-to-end. -end. Um, making sure you have an environment where underrepresented folks will want to be is important. <coughs> so you create a space that's welcoming, and then you go out and look for people that you want to be in it, um, and figure out how to keep them there. 
Uh, I read an article the other day that said professional development opportunities are very helpful in that regard for a lot of underrepresented folks. And what else do we have? And hire Atlanta. Yes. <laughs> Participate in Drupal Diversity and Inclusion, which is a handy segue into our next section. I think this one's me again. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little bit about us. We did get a moment in the keynote yesterday, so you got to hear some of our history there. So we'll go too far into it, but Nikki Stevens did found the group in 2016. This was after a successful session and then a follow-up boff um, where there was just a lot of energy and a lot of people talking and sharing like very specific tips and strategies for how they're getting by in the workplace and how they're not getting by in the workplace. Um, our mandate really, I think, is to be a safe space in the community for our women, people of color, religious minorities, people with different abilities, all, all the people, really. Um, because we don't see a lot of these people when we say like notice who's in the room. You don't see a lot of those folks at the events, right? So we want to um, provide support there. It's hard often to like network when you're different from everyone else at the event. We want to help build those networks, that kind of thing. So um, some of the barriers, it's so long and it's not even all of them. Um, racism, sexism, ableism, classism, transphobia, homophobia, ageism, mental health, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, xenophobia, language barriers, discrimination based on body type or appearance, and other forms of oppression that either are not named or invented yet. Um, uh, we really like to try to take this intersectional approach um, and make sure people with all of these uh, forms of oppression acting in their lives have a place to be. I guess it's not me anymore. So this is our current leadership team. So Tara is our leader, and myself, Ellie, Mark, Alex, and Alex <laughs> are the rest of our leadership team. So these people are involved in the daily operations of GDI and help to run our initiatives. So we've recently outlined online how our leadership is chosen. So this is included in our Drupal.org documentation, which I'm also very happy that we have. And then we have an advisory team, which is made up of Nikki, our founder, Greg, Ruby, Fatima, who was our former leader, Nat, and Heather. So these are folks who pop in from time to time based on their availability, and we can turn to them for advice and support and knowledge. Ah, this is me. Uh, these are just a few of the initiatives we're working on right now. I think we might be done with Drupal Europe planning, so oh, yeah, we need updated. But fresh or you get the idea. Um, we are still, I think, working on this deck as the standardized DDI talk. talk. Um, we're working on speaker training and outreach. That's been a big deal this year. If you didn't catch um, the keynote yesterday, it's pretty nifty. I think we have another slide about that. Uh, DDI resources. That's my department. We have an awesome resource library as well. It's, awesome. it's, it's very when you want to tell someone to RTFM about anything, yeah. the website is the best to go. Yeah. Uh, that's testimonial. <laughs> Can yeah. you repeat the testimonial for the recording? <laughs> when you want to tell someone to RTFM, that's the best place to go. Our website. DrupalDiversity.com slash resources. Indeed. Seriously, every time I'm like, I know I've read an article about XYZ thing, it's there, it's great. So we have a lot of things going on, and you are more than welcome to come help out. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. One thing that's coming up in two weeks, we've got the Train the Trainers workshop. So following on to the Speaker Diversity workshop and whole initiative, we've got a workshop to train you to run a Speaker Diversity workshop wherever you are. Yeah. And that's the handy link. Um, so, oh no, this is you still, sorry, oh. not holding space. Uh, we've got weekly meetings every Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. I lost track of daylight savings time in Europe, sorry. Um, we've got the issue queue. You can always find something to work on there. Four o'clock, Amsterdam local. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Um, we've got the resource library. If you stumble across a cool article or something you want to add, just go to the resource library, add it, it will go through a little approval process, and it'll be up. 
and Twitter. Feel free to retweet. Or tweet and we'll retweet you. You've probably seen this one before. Um, I will be at the Contribution Lounge um, in the morning working on like DDI stuff. If you want to come get like learn the ropes of how this works, how our issue key works, help me figure out how to run the JavaScript thing, <laughs> come on over. Um, are we doing gender fields? Slash OD, open demographics? I've got a. No, sorry, issue. not totally putting you on the spot. No, I've got an issue. I actually have the mentor spreadsheet. Right oh! <laughs> So the, another yes. another project that we've uh, been working on is gender field, which um, for those of you who have been in Drupal for longer than a year-ish, there used to be a gender field with four options. It was so, what? I think that was Jesse's project. Are you Jesse? This is the famous Jesse. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, my mind is Sorry, blown right now. Down. Jesse started a gender field that was on Drupal.org, and then we adopted it two years ago. Um, anyway, it was like a total magical DrupalCon moment where someone was like, hey, you should take over gender field for Drupal 8. And I was like, I don't know, Jesse. Hey, Jesse, do you want to give me your module? <laughs> and Jesse's like, yeah, please. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we sprinted on it at Nashville. Sure. I think for the first time, and we'll be doing more. So come on down. We're tying it into Open Demographics, which is another open source project that's sort of like a nothing about us without us demographics project. So um, rather than having like a bunch of men decide women's health care, not that that has ever happened in the United States, uh, we have people who are represented by the demographics offering what they want to be called. So our gender field list is like much more comprehensive and inclusive than any other gender field list I've ever seen. Anyway, long story. Oh, and one quick note on contributing. Um, most of the time, if you ever want to work on a module, it goes exactly like that. You find the person who's working on the module, and you're like, hey, can I work on your module? And they're like, yes, please. And then now you work on that module. That's exactly how it happens. And then five years later, you repeat the cycle, and you're the person who's like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is, yeah. So if you want to rate this survey, we'd love to hear your thoughts. It's on the app. There's also a survey for the whole con. I think we still have maybe like three minutes for questions, but we can also stick around a little bit. So, questions, thoughts? We can clap too. Yeah. Yes, do you mind going to the mic so we can hear? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, just so the recording people yeah, can. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> uh, so, I can't help but notice that um, there's three white mm -hmm. females doing this discussion. And of course, if you don't have other people, you're gonna have to do it like this. But you do have more like diverse people in your team, I saw. Um, why are they not here? <laughs> it's an awesome question. Um, partly because of just practical reasons. Like we certainly invited them and it's expensive to get to Europe, and they're all from the US, so that's part of it. Um, part of it is that I think one of our guiding philosophies has been that racism is largely a white people problem, um, and so rather than asking people of color to do the work for us, we have attempted to um, elevate voices. I would love to see more people of color on the organizing team um, and active in Drupal and everywhere, like in general, but I think Specifically for Amsterdam, it's largely funding, which is totally structural in the sense that it's very easy for me to get a job because I'm a white person, and it's easy for me to get a job that pays me to come here, right? Like, it's relatively speaking pretty easy. That would be, I don't know, <laughs> anything to add. Yeah, because um, I was think I was thinking, um, actually, maybe, I hope I'm not offending anyone here. If a white male would be doing this talk with you, uh, it might um, get the message across even stronger because they are literally from the group that you are addressing right now. So they are basically saying, we can, we, um, I, I stand for this as a person that is part of the problem. Um, so they're basically validating your message, if you could say that. That's why, mm -hmm. and I think there are a few men from your group here, right? Or not? Yeah. yeah. So um, 
So that's why I was thinking they are here. <laughs> yeah. Well, Alex is a little shy, and that's fine. Um, so we respect everyone in our group, whether not you know not everyone on the leadership team likes to speak, and that's fine. And we have given this talk with other men on the team. Um, and again, not everyone came to this conference. Not everyone's company wanted to send them to this conference, and that's totally fine. So this is just how it shook out this time, um, which I think this is the first time at a Drupal Con that it's ever been all women. No, we well, Drupal Europe. Oh, okay, yeah. So I guess at Drupal Europe, it does tend to be all women, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, I did recently read an article uh, where a woman analyzed her Twitter, uh, like, activity where people liked or retweeted her stuff. Uh, she's a technical woman, tweeted about a bunch about tech, but noticed that the only thing that ever got traction was diversity tweets. And she ran a bunch of uh, analysis on a wide variety of Twitter accounts and basically concluded that men are listened to about tech and women are listened to about diversity, which I just found kind of depressing and interesting. Hi, thank you so much for doing this talk. Thank you so much for all the work that you do in the channel and for the community. It's amazing and so important. Um, oh, sorry, my name's Megan. Um, something I am frustrated about is that this room is not packed. Yes. And um, I had tried to do an initiative that didn't gain much traction as part of an apprenticeship type of group and the feedback was that kept kind of happening was um, oh we care about diversity but then like no one came or like companies didn't sign up or to sponsor people and so when I look around this room and I see important people doing the work and and showing up but then i don't see um as many people who have influence to ch to make change it's really frustrating and i kind of, i'm not going to take a picture of the room but um i want to be like where the f are you <laughs> like why aren't you here if you care so much about diversity can you please show up and so i wanted to ask what should we start calling people out directly? Like, what is the next step for making the DDNI group sustainable for more for more years to come? I think calling people in is a little <laughs> more helpful. Like, in terms of like, so the way that we got Dries to do the keynote last year was by reaching out and being like, hey, we'd love to work with you. We want to help. And yeah, we want to help you and help talk to you about diversity. And we wondered if you had any thoughts about like what you were going to talk about in the Dries note. And like that evolved into, and originally it was supposed to be like this little short piece of it. And it wound up being sort of the focus of the Dries note. So I think as much as I would love to call people out and take a picture and be like, how many tags can I fit in one tweet? Um, because I'm exactly that kind of person and I'm exactly that petty. Um, <laughs> I think that it sort of a more flies with honey situation where trying to call people in and giving them something actionable where it's like, hey, we'd love to do X. Can we get your help with doing A, B, and C? Like, And it feels like telling people to show up to a session would be just that simple, but maybe that doesn't feel like beneficial or like actionable enough. So I feel like and, and I feel like your initiative was actionable enough too, but like maybe just trying to get like, just very specifically approaching people and asking them, you know, to do something and trying to think of it as like some benefit to them. You know, I don't, do you guys have other Yeah, ideas? I wanna say one thing, we're over time. If you gotta go, no hard feelings whatsoever. Also, we're looking for European community members. We have very few and like, it's extremely difficult for us in the US to understand like the, the ground level what's going on here. So like, come on into the channel. We have a special European channel too. So um, just wanted to say that briefly about this question. I feel like this is also, I was really frustrated a little bit this morning with like, we have all these init or tracks that are proposed now for Drupal 9 or Beyond 9 that are like going to rely on a diverse community and will fail without that. Like you cannot serve the global population well without having a diverse community. And yet there's like zero infrastructure. It's like, oh, the DA is gonna fix it. And I like the DA, but like, come on, that's like, we all have to be involved. And your apprenticeship initiative like could absolutely be a thing like JSON API. 
Yeah. And why is it not? Oh. That's all. Just angry. <laughs> Do you want to go? Um, I was just going to say something in response to, uh, related to the thing you said about we need European members. Um, I was having one of those ad hoc conversations with a member of the community that I've known a long time earlier today. And this person was like, oh my gosh, well, you know, people in Europe, they're just terrified of saying the wrong thing. We want to help support diversity and inclusion, but we're, we're afraid we're going to say the wrong thing and it's going to ruin our careers. And I'm like, okay, I mean, yes, I, listening is good. Start, just maybe just listen <laughs> rather than saying anything. Um, we kind of went around and around and around about that. But I think that, um, I don't know, if, is, there, like, is there a way that we can, like, work with like the event organizing teams here, these, the, I don't know, this person was actually, in a, just was an American dude, it wasn't actually someone from the European community, but was, was represented saying, oh, the, all the Europeans are afraid of being <laughs> because they're all gonna swarm and, right. I'm like, okay. Anyway, it was an interesting no, it conversation, interesting. but it is an action, yeah. it is a fear that you mm -hmm. know, a, lot, a lot of people in the European community yeah. have, it's like, they, they have good intentions, <laughs> Yeah, but um, facts, they don't. Yeah. They're afraid or unable to take the next step. So I'm, I like that idea. Like to yeah, find a way to make it work. Or right, we should definitely stop because there's a whole thing going on. Thank you all. Sorry we ran over. Thank you.